Hello, I'm Azai. Welcome back to Tokyo Necro. I just came back from taking a short break, went to the bathroom, got some more water, ate uh, a sandwich, and I am back. Last time we made a different choice for Ethica, so she is now not a living dead, while Soen is still a living dead. And Okoyasu is alive. Oh boy. I guess we'll see what's gonna happen now. Captain Nagisa sticks out a megaphone from behind her car and aims at aims it at Tokyo Tower. <laughs> Pieces of the shattered megaphone hit the snow laden ground. Laden. A precise, well-aimed shot blew it to smithereens. I assume we're actually against Tokitaka and Ethica. <sighs> Having said that, we're in no position to disobey. I don my X brain and look up at the sky from the shade of the trees. Our target apparently took a great number of allies and barricaded himself away the top of the frozen over Tokyo Tower. I hurl a pair of smoke grenades at two separate locations pinpointed by my X brain. White smoke begins to rapidly envelop the two areas that its calculations have deemed the most suitable for our current strategy. The grenades are filled with chaff and should obstruct even invisible light. But due to our opponent's impeccable precision and accuracy, there's still not a there's still not a ticket to safety. We leap out from cover and make for the foot of Tokyo Tower in a zigzag. Sure enough, we immediately get fired at, even through the thick layer of smoke screen. The shooter carefully follows our erratic movements and fires off one supersonic bullet after another. We reach the staircase leading up the tower, chunks of snow and ice kicked up by the bullets spring against us. I aim for the SMES located at the robot's abdominal area and fire off a shot from point blank range. Superconducting magnetic energy storage, used to power a humanoid operating machine, does not suffer from degradation like typical batteries and can be recharged nearly instantaneously, but expensive compared to, e.g., the batteries found in the, in the engines of compre compressed air vehicles. The bullet destroys the robot's superconductive coil, sending its convulsing body tumbling down the stairs. Tokyo Tower has been an abandoned, build abandoned ruin for ages, Meaning there's no way any security robots would normally be stationed here. I mustn't slow down. I need to keep going. I hear the sound of footsteps from above, and soon enough, I'm facing down several more security robots. Sounding no warning whatsoever, they immediately start firing their assault rifles through the gaps in the railing. I follow my ex-brain's instructions and nimbly dance my way through the tight stairwell. Outwitting the robot's targeting algorithms, I manage to dodge the incoming hail of bullets by a hair's breadth, continuing my steady advance up the stairs. <laughs> Gijo Mitsumi's hand handling of the situation, however, is on an entirely different level. She slices through the wi wire mesh, icicles and all, then reaches for the handrails with all her might and takes a leaping shortcut to get higher. She gets to about two floors higher compared to me, taking the security robot standing guard there by surprise. I hear the ear-piercing roar of their rifles, followed by a couple of small explosions, and finally, see the pieces of metal and debris that rain down from above. By the time I reach the landing where she is, the, s the fight is already finished. Mitsumi stands amid a thick cloud of gunpowder smoke, her white bodysuit as clean as and 
as untouched snow. Mitsumi's harsh tone makes her dissatisfaction clear as day. Captain Nagisa continues paying her no heed. Okay, this can't be Ethica then. Why would she steal, you know, human operating machines? The exact moment Mitsumi utters her question, we see a grenade dropping down from the floor above. My x brain doles out its instruction without a moment's delay, prompting me to shield Mitsumi's body with my own. An explosion rings out, and various pieces of flying debris pierce my coat. Having sensed the danger, my magnetic liquid armor suit does everything it can to soften the blow, but there's only so much it can do at such a close range. The splinters end up lodged inside my body. There's no need for her to apologize. After all, I'm a living dead. I no longer feel any pain. Only th two things make me aware of the damage to my body. The dusky red blood that gushes forth from my chest, and my ex-brain, which displays an injury report, having yet to fully recognize me as undead. Mitsumi continues up the flight of stairs without meeting my gaze. Intending to provide backup, I use my MPP to produce some microsurge bullets to be used against the security robots. One of many specialty bullets zones MPP is capable of producing produces a microsurge upon impact, destroying the target's electrical circuits from within, effective against human operating machines. She slices, I shoot. We know each other's pros and cons, making up for what the, others the other lacks. We should make a good team. But something's not right. My body's riddled with metallic fragments from the grenade, while her bodysuit is tainted with dark splotches of oil. A group of ordinary security robots shouldn't be giving us such a hard time. We used to be able to put up a much better fight than this, apparently. That's more or less what Captain Nagisa told us while evaluating our battle from afar. I don't quite understand what she meant. I'm a machine that converts input into output. I obey my orders and kill my enemies. That's how it should be. Another security robot descends from the roof. I take care of it, I take care of it using a microsurge bullet and continue onward. Having destroyed the 10th security robot, we finally make it to the top. However, when Mitsumi sets foot upon the final landing, she suddenly stops in place. Mitsumi seems adamant, and shows no sign of budging. Are we fighting just Tokitaka alone? Why would he steal, like, uh, security robots, though? I proceed to reload my re-eliminators. After using the X-Brain to check my vitals and make sure every part of my body functions as it should, I silently make my way up the final staircase. Flakes of snow dance in a fierce sideways wind that blows across the ruined top floor of Tokyo Tower. I feel like I've been here before. When was it? I can no longer recall. There's no need to either. Ichihara Tokitaka. The Living Dead Stalker system has been abolished. This is no different from what happened after the conclusion of the Sino-American War, when necromancers, who knew only how to fight, were branded as criminals. Now, many former Living Dead Stalkers who once earned a living by hunting the, the undead have turned to committing acts of illegal violence. Only a lucky few managed to start over at New positions like Mitsumi and I did. I can't answer. Kara Suzumi Ikatsu used to be my mentor. I think. 
but my memories of him have all become vague, muddy. It's hardly anything to lament at this point. Tokitaka points his rifle straight at me. It's his trusty Ugasawara TFD-20, the same one he used to fire at us when, he w when we were down at the foot of the tower. It's a gun that saved my life more times than I can count. And right now, it's being aimed at my head. My ex-brain comes to its final decision. Peaceful negotiations have failed. Gripping my twin re-eliminators, I proceed to lunge at Tokitaka. It is st statistically the most optimal course of action to take here, as advised by my ex-brain. I swiftly close the distance between myself and Tokitaka using the graceful, artistic movements of CQ CQAMA. It won't be quite that simple though. Our respective ex-brains both possess a wealth of information on the, on the other. A literal clash of predictions and calculations results in a firework of sparks as my guns meet this anti-material rifle. Normally, Tokitaka's weapon specializes in providing long-range support. It can, however, be wielded as an aginata when forced into close quarters combat. I close in on him. He draws further away. Man, I can't believe we're fighting Tokitaka. Fuck you, Hokuyasu. We each follow our ex-brain's instructions, carrying out optimal move after optimal move. I wanted o Hokuyasu to actually kill, you know, Juichiro, but still, this is fucked up. Having endured rigorous training together, we both know every last thing about the other's style of fighting, resulting in a state of seemingly perpetual stalemate. Yet, with each inevitable exchange of blows, our available options grow fewer and fewer in number. Will this end with my victory? Or perhaps... Tokitaka shouts into my face. Pity. I try and fail to recall that emotion. After evading a thrust from Tokitaka's bayonet, I quickly rush him down. Checkmate. I finally brought our tug of war to its conclusion. My experience displays an alert. My reaction is delayed by a split second, perhaps due to an intrusive thought, or the fact that I've become a living dead. The butt of Tokitaka's anti-material rifle, accelerated by the recoil of his shot, crashes into my side. The attack comes as a complete surprise, sending my body flying. Tokitaka then thrusts his bayonet at me without so much as missing a beat. Still on the floor, I manage to dodge out of its way at the last moment, only to be stopped when my back hits the railing. The snow blows against the back of my head. I'm staring down the barrel of Tokitaka's rifle. My ex-brain is no longer of any help. Tokitaka's finger squeezes the trigger. In mere moments, I will be mercilessly re-eliminated. By all means, he should easily be able to do that. But he does not. God damn it, Tokitaka. You idiot. Without the means or the need to know why he's given me this brief opening, I immediately use the opportunity to trip Tokitaka's legs and get up. I step on his anti-material rifle and pull the trigger of my re-eliminator. I fire off three consecutive shots. Each bullet finds its target without fail, destroying the visor of Tokitaka's helmet. I then force the rest of his ex- his ex-brain off him. Tokitaka's face is now exposed, but I can no longer read his expression. He could have re-eliminated me. And I just I don't just mean when I was on the ground just now. Knowing his skill with a rifle, 
He could have easily shot me dead through the smoke screen. The reason I took point back then was to at least try and protect Mitsumi. I shot Tokitaka. Did I do that because he's, he's a criminal? Or because my master ordered me to do so? My finger on the trigger is trembling. Tokitaka's face twists into a bitter grimace. Well, oh, there's actually fireworks outside, so... I think you guys can somehow, or, you know, hear it a bit. Hopefully not too much. Something to live for. It feels like an alien concept to me now. What happened to Area Zone? What the fuck? But that's fine. It's not something I need anymore. I grabbed Tokitaka's lifeless body and hoisted it over my shoulder. Mitsumi pats me on the shoulder. That simple act used to fill my cold, dying heart with something akin to warmth. I listlessly make my way down the icy staircase. I don't even feel the weight of Tokitaka's body on my shoulder. I hear a song in the distance. It's Substance Concept. Her voice, however, no longer fascinates me like it used to. So Subcon is still alive. I thought that after we destroyed the living dead material, she would also cease to exist. But I guess then again, she was also still alive back in the last route we did, even after the material thing was destroyed. The skies over Tokyo are always cloudy. As a result, people are rarely aware of when the sun actually sets. The boundary between day and night is blurred. In other words, here in Tokyo, nighttime really creeps up on you. You don't notice how dark it was until you actually think to turn on the lights. It's kind of hard to be actively conscious of ch change when you're right in the middle of it. I lift my thumb and pinky, then bring them to my ear. I can hear her sigh from the other end of the line. Judging by her silence, I assume she's anticipating a reply. But I can't be bothered. <laughs> She's wasting her breath stating the obvious. Now that I think about it, this whole thing feels like it's been planned out in advance. Around the same time the Tokyo Megafold collapsed, the military police moved in to occupy the fortress. Once the Empire Energy Corp was thrust into disorder, the military police, under the pretext of maintaining public order in the city, took over management of the central geothermal power plant of Tokyo. The city also saw a rapid de decline in necromancer-related crimes following the announcement of Milgram's death, whom the suicide wannabes treated as their personal pro prophet. The military police abolished the private special living dead stalker system and began hunting down necromancers themselves. As a result, many of the dis... dis Descent for what the fuck? Descent franchise. What? Descent franchised. What? How do you say that? Descent franchised. What the hell? Living that stalkers affected by this change would either find the find new work under the military police, much like Son and Mitsumin did, or become unemployed drifters like yours truly. Still, others opted to turn on society as a whole and became become corrupted outcasts like Tokitaka did. Kazuma hangs up. I stayed sprawled over the sofa, not moving a muscle. The desk is littered with discarded boxes of ramen and various other types of instant food. They're starting to smell pretty damn foul, but I can't work up the motivation to clean them up.
Subcon singing fills the silence of the room. One of her live performances is playing on the, t on the TV. She's no longer doing her citywide guerrilla gigs, but these new performances are even more effective than they were in the past. Just watching them, watching them is enough to calm anyone down. Hagyo Iria, featuring Substance Concept. What? The person behind this footage is Iria, who's found herself a new job as a VR designer. The subcon she's controlling sings a melody as soft and soothing as a lullaby. In fact, it's making me doze off. I don't feel like getting up. Guess I'll take a nap. Time to catch some Z's. ちかちゃん。いつまで寝てるのえっと。もう少し。ダメよ。ほら。もう夕飯できてるんだから。今日は私の特製カレーなんだから。ああ、またあのカライやつ。大丈夫。そんなことないでしょ? Ryoko must have lost her sense of taste a while back. There's no other explanation for how spicy that curry was. I had plenty of opportunities to realize that Ryoko died. Same goes for Son. But I never did. And so, this is probably my punishment for that. I get up. I feel something moist on my cheeks. Tears. That's it. I can't take this. This place is too heavy with Ryoko's scent. I leave the agency as a way to escape that scent. I'm dead. No matter how advanced the necromancy used, the living dead are set to lose their emotions within two weeks at most. I wonder if I was supposed to feel anything when I shot Tokitaka. If I were still human, maybe I would have. But I didn't. Not a thing. I received input, then converted it to output like a good machine. I can't even find anything wrong with that now. If there's one thing I can still feel sad about, it's... <laughs> Iria spreads her arms wide and jumps forward, embracing me. As her body presses against mine, I can feel her warmth, albeit only slightly. After leaving the Kara Suzumi Living Death Stalker Agency, I began living in this room with Iria. I take some time to think about what Iria is trying to convey. No good. I have no idea what she means by cool. Oh. Now that she mentions it, the place no longer looks like a sick room at the military police hospital. Iria pulls me deeper into the room. Through projection mapping, it's been made to resemble the bedroom of a lavish mansion. A high ceiling, a generous amount of ornaments and decorations, and even a canopy bed. It looks like a place fit for a princess. When Iria sits down and brings up a virtual keyboard with a multi-flick, a small hollow screen materializes in front of her. 
It's showing a muted video of that performance they gave in the city earlier. Oh, sorry. She's teared up a little. According to Iria, Subcon helped her when the Tokyo Mega Float sank. That was a week ago. Substance Concept hasn't delivered any citywide performances since then. Apparently, Subcon sank to the bottom of the ocean along with the Mega Float, and Iria feels responsible. She's now using her VR program to remember and to try and call her back. So, this Subcon is a fake. Responding to Iria's request, I draw closer to her. For a while now, Iria has been craving physical contact, almost as if she's clinging onto something. I'm losing far too many things. My feelings, my memories, my very identity, the past, the present, and likely the future too. But I can still feel Iria's warmth. As long as I do, I know I'll be fine. Iria gently wipes the tears off my face. That means I'm still capable of crying. Even if I myself can no longer feel the tears rolling down my cheeks. Perhaps I need her more than she needs me. I sense an order from my master. I must perform my duties. Slowly but surely, my reluctance to go fades away. As a living dead, I'm incapable of disobeying an order from my master. Necromancy is, an, is a mysterious craft. I'm not directly receiving a message, nor can I hear a voice in my head. Our relationship is more like that of a ventriloquist than his doll. The only thing that still belongs to me is my heart, my mind. Free will is guaranteed even to those who revive through necromancy. For instance, they cannot be forced to confess their secrets. Otherwise, it'd be too easy to just kill an enemy soldier, bring them back with necromancy, and use it to learn everything they know. Allowing one's heart to remain a, sa a sacred, impenetrable domain might just be the one final act of mercy left by God before he vanished from this world for good. Yet soon enough, even my heart will be gone. I run into my master in the elevator. We might have been drawn together by the power of necromancy, but I have no way of knowing for certain. My master, the one who saved me after being killed by Milgram, is Kibano Harahukoyasu. A fact that doesn't elicit any particular emotion for me, be it positive or negative. I am a living dead after all. Olga still alive? The place I flee to is Amehoko. The bustling shopping district with its countless stands and stalls emits the kind of vibrant liveliness you won't find in Shinjuku Kabuki Cho. Patrolled by the Eclipse Corp, a private military company made up of former US Army veterans, the area exists as a commercial district that boasts a relatively low crime rate. It's also sort of a melting pot of various different cultures and currencies. Japanese, Chinese, Russian, American, and so on. Like a microcosm of the entire city in a, in a sense. Hmm. Sure smells nice around here. Having been fed nothing but instant noodles as of late, 
My poor stomach roars out in protest, demanding something that qualifies as real food. I see no reason not to give the greedy little basset what it wants. I don't know, I feel like uh, instant noodles are good every single day. You're probably just uh, eating like too little calories, uh, Ethica. Spotting an Indonesian merchant running a sat satay cart nearby, I promptly buy several pieces and eat them on the spot. They're basically takoyaki with some peanut sauce. I don't eat them with peanut sauce though because I don't like peanut sauce. Satay is a Southeast Asian dish made with grilled meat, served on a skewer with all sorts of sweet and salty sauces. I'd say it's kind of like Japanese yakitori, but I ordered the ones with beef and goat meat. So I guess that's the not that's that an analogy out the window. Well, whatever. Meat's meat, you know. And it tastes amazing. Once I'm done, I wash it down with some crazy dragon. Man, that's some good eating. The funny thing is that it's actually helped cheer me up a bit. We humans sure are simple creatures. Or maybe it's just me. Honestly though, it's not like overthinking stuff is gonna solve everything. Simple is best as they say. Also, it's my first time getting out of the house in god knows how long so... I might as well let loose a little. Until the 21st century, traffic congestions were apparently a daily occurrence in Tokyo. At the time, the three main elements of driving, recognition, judgment, and operation were all performed by humans, which meant that the flow of traffic was jerky and fluctuating. Although the number of vehicles in the city didn't defer all that much compared to present-day Tokyo, traveling by car proved exceedingly difficult. These days, however, self-driving cars are the norm. Even without using this particular highway, once caught the Shudo Expressway, the amount of time needed to reach your destination won't be too different. You gotta pay a toll to use this road. Only special individuals like government officials or those working for the military police frequently make use of it. Man, the info dumps are back, dude. Holy shit, what's going on? Living dead stalkers are also exempt from paying the toll, or at least they used to be, while the private special living dead stalker system was still in place. In other words, I'm paying to use the expressway out of my own pocket right now. Which is all the more reason for me to try and enjoy this a little. Or more than just a little. I disabled the auto drive function and switched to ma manual mode. I put the pedal to the metal and speed through the highway like the wind. The car starts shaking a little, but it only lasts a moment before the shock resistant panel adjusts the angle in accordance with the vehicle's speed stabilizing it. As my body presses against the driver's seat, I can feel the vibrations of the engine. Hell yeah! Now this is what I'm talking about. Nothing like a good drive to make a girl feel truly alive. Machines always overestimate risks. They often fail in determining exactly how far you can push yourself in a certain situation. Their willingness to go just a little overboard is woefully lacking. Which is why us humans have to learn how to handle risky driving. I don't know about that, Ethico. I do like going fast on my bike, though. Steering left and right like a madwoman, I overtake several taxis while speeding toward the next junction. The road leading to the right has been blocked off. The part of the Shudo Expressway that collapsed into the Nihonbashi River still hasn't been rebuilt. I still remember it like it was yesterday. On our way back from the snowbound, nir snowbound nirvana, a group of SAD operatives took us ca captive. That's when that Pavlov asshole attacked us. Pavlov is should still be alive too right now, by the way. And Olga, so I wonder what they're gonna do. We somehow managed to take the bastard out, only to get hauled off to the Tokyo Mega Float, where we fell right into Milgram's trap. The floating metro metropolis that used to give home to the energy elites sank to the bottom of the ocean and... I noticed an approaching taxi and hastily jerked the steering wheel out of reflex. But I end up turning it a little too much. Though I attempt to salvage the situation, it's all too late. My front wheels crash into the railing separating the two lanes, causing the car to, go, to flip upside down. 
I soar through the air in slow motion. Shit. I'm gonna die here. The first thing that flashes through my mind... ...is Kiri. I mean, of course, who else? I've had many a tango with death over the years. Not gonna lose my cool here. I steal myself and hold on to the handle with all the strength I can muster. As expected, the computer responsible for controlling the shock-resistant panel has already come up with the most efficient countermeasure. The car almost spins sideways in the air, but it manages to turn back in the right direction and lands in the opposite lane with a light bounce. A cluster of cars is coming straight at me. I immediately turn the wheel to the right, then to the left to try and evade the, un the oncoming traffic. The ensuing wind pressure beats down hard against my car. One wrong move could be fatal here, but for some reason, I'm having an absolute blast. My heart's beating in my chest like a jackhammer, pumping adrenaline throughout my body. And you know what? I feel like a million bucks. Ethica is certainly, you know, someone with a character. I wonder what's gonna happen, like, with Soen once uh, he knows that Ethica is dead, if the situation was reversed. Now this is what it means to be truly alive. Anyway, so after all that, I arrive at Shibuya. This part of town is round but run by the Tetra Dragons, who are closely involved with the Machi robotic industries. I think we're gonna be meeting the Tetra Dragons in this route, aren't we? Like I said, we're probably gonna be meeting some of the... You know, like, uh, people that run over Tokyo in other routes like the Tetra Gang, the Malacca Gang, the Chinese Mafia, the Russian, and then the ex-US Army, right? With the fortress now under new management, I figured they'd be stirring up some trouble. But oddly enough, I'm not seeing any sign of that. I can only assume the military police struck some kind of backroom deal with them. Those sons of bitches really do consider everything. The moment I step into the building, I'm immediately hit by blurring music that threatens to rupture my eardrums. Varying shades of red illuminate the dance floor while a numbingly sweet scent wafts through the air. Guess it's same old, same old at the dream of the red chamber. I show my ID to the security bot at the entrance. All oh, right. I've been stripped of my living dead stalker license. I hand rabbit punch over to the security bot and continue toward the dance floor. Young people high on electric signal drugs shake and twirl their bodies in mad ecstasy. As a rhythmic thrum of the dance beat courses through my body, I can feel my heart rate escalate. The tiny glittering particles of light floating about in the smoke put me in a trance. The people hooked on this stuff say it's better than sex, which I'm not buying, but it's probably still hella addictive. Compared to the chemical drugs that used to dominate the market in the old world, electrical signal drugs are considerably safer. They don't put much strain on the body, nor do they have any lasting side effects if used in moderation. People do seem, gr seem to grow psycho psychologically dependent on the stuff, but hey, unless you live your entire life under a rock, you're bound to find yourself hooked on something eventually. True enough. Besides, we live in an age where the secrets of the brain have most, mostly been mapped out. No need to get all freaked out about drugs in general. Having said that, forcibly sending your brain to La La Land with outside stimuli is bound to screw with your reward system one way or another. And I'm not really sure how to feel about that, you know? Even if it wouldn't hinder me in my daily life. It might potentially affect my physical output in extreme situations, such as on the battlefield. Long story short, that's why I've avoided this stuff until now. But at this point, there's no need to be stubborn about it anymore, is there? Is there? I mean, I'm no longer a living dead stalker, right? I'm probably not gonna find myself in any life or death situations anytime soon. Having come to that conclusion, 
I probably make my way into the electric signal drug den. I find myself in a dark room with a heavy, stagnant air. It's been a while since my last visit. It was back when I was I was still gave enough. Oh, it was back when I still gave enough of a shit to argue with my old man. I enter an area partitioned off by curtains, where a mechanical server approaches me and offers an electric signal drug pad. Only the faint light of gently swinging paper lanterns illuminates the gloomy darkness of the room. I place the electrode pad on my temple and take a deep breath. The effects kick in right away. These electric signal drugs, which work their magic directly inside your brain, apparently induce a state of synesthesia. The contours of light that enter my vision begin to gradually blur and distort. The phenomenon is in tune with the distant beat of the music from the main hall. It starts out mild, but gets progressively stronger as time goes on. I can feel the melody the melody of the music brushing against my skin, and hear the slow pulsations of the arteries in my brain. The entire world seems to grind to a halt. As I get whisked away to another dimension, the sickly sweet scent drifting in from outside the room warms its way directly into my brain, slowly melting it away. The light keeps swarming rings as it descends into my head. Its surface gently sways in the wind. Oh, I see. What's swaying in the breeze is a lotus. And what I'm smelling is that flavor capsule. I hear a voice. It belongs to someone. Someone I love. More than anything. But I... I choose to forget. Things are fine this way. I couldn't save anyone. And lost someone I held dear. But the world remains the same. It keeps on turning like it always did. Things might even be a bit better now. I was wrong. I acted like a child. A spoiled, selfish brat. Nothing more. Nothing less. At least... I think so. Of course not. But my feelings will never reach her. Kiri's not here with me. She chose my old man. I tear off the electric signal drug pad. A bad trip. Just my luck. The mechanical server hurries after me as I leave, but I quickly settle the bill via my conry, then take rabbit punch back from the security bot at the entrance and step out of the building. Oh, for fuck's sake. Why am I getting so pissed off by a goddamn hallucination? Well, that little temper tantrum solved absolutely nothing. I just can't get Kiri out of my mind. It's gotcha. She turned back on the ramp but ultimately stepped into the gunship without finishing her sentence. I haven't contacted her since. She hasn't reached out to me either. We're both trying to respect the other's decision. Never crossing that final line. All we gotta do is keep a reasonable distance from one another without overstepping our bond boundaries. It's what's best for the two of us. But for me personally, it's the worst possible outcome. Startled, I turn around and see a familiar beauty standing at the poolside with a warm smile on her lips. It's Olga. I get a little irritated. What does she think she knows about me? あなたが思っているほど世界は単純じゃないの。それは言い訳。心と言葉と行動で世界は動くの。意外と単純よ。何しにここに? 
一仕事終わったからあなたを誘いにねエチカ今夜は暇かしら Her lips utter an alluring invitation. Does she really think I'd give in that easily? The old me probably would have. But things are different now. I can no longer live as, I sim as simply as I used to. Too much has happened. Ever since I met her, I knew she was no ordinary woman. But not even I expected Sori Yuka's name to pop up like this. So you're Roshaka. I was wondering who the hell this was because it was on the, you know, on the staff list, on the, you know, on the voice actor segment, on the credits. A woman who originally claimed to be a human broker named Olga. Uh, I see an H scene there. Major General Kibanohara and I make our way down the corridor leading to a certain room in the military police's hospital. Before we reach our destination though, he abruptly stops. There's seemingly no one else around. A regular sensor certainly wouldn't pick up anything. But as a living dead, I can just barely sense something. Not light, nor heat, or even a smell. Rather, a presence of sorts. After becoming undead, most of my former senses have dulled, but my ability to detect humans have grown strangely acute. At least that's how it feels to me. Major General Kibanohara has taken notice as well. He reaches into the darkness of the seemingly empty room. <laughs> and pulls away an invisible piece of cloth made from camouflage meta-material, revealing Sofia Kawarizaki and Yamanuma Kagikatsu, both of whom were supposed to be in their respective sick rooms. Material used to affect optical camouflage can be formed to, into a sheet to cover one's body with, commonly used by self-defense force. They seem to have been attempting to escape. As I take aim with, my, with a real eliminator, Yamanuma steps in front of me to shield Sophia from harm. Sophia's words are laced with resonation. She goes on, still addressing the man standing in front of her. Yamanuma, Yamanuma is unable to mask his surprise. Sophia continues to speak, her tone steeped in conviction. Wait, what? Okay, so he's also a living dead already at this point. I see. The Major General remains unflinching in the face of Sophia's glare. His only response is silence. Instead, the one to speak up in protest is Yamanuma. Yamanuma looks and sounds thoroughly desperate as he pleads with Sophia. Yet her gaze is aimed only at Hokuyasu. Still not a word from the Major General. He maintains his silence simply because the answer should be all too obvious. Following the collapse of the Tokyo Mega Float, the Empire Energy Corp was stripped of its former influence. As the dust began to settle, the military police stepped forward to take control of the city. Yet the Empire Energy Corp was not without a final ace up its sleeves. The central geothermal power plant of Tokyo, which supplies the entire city with energy. Granting authority over the plant requires a unique password that only Sophia Kawarizaki knows. 
preventing unwanted individuals from usurping control of the system. Killing Sophia and turning her into an obedient living dead would allow one to bypass biometric authentication, but not even necromancy could force her to reveal the password tucked away in the back of her mind. Sophia addresses the Major General with the commanding aura she used to wield as the Empire Energy Corp CEO. My master finally parts his lips to speak. His ironclad expression betrays not a shred of his emotions. He's almost more of a living dead than I am. <laughs> Yamanuma, being controlled by necromancy, takes Sophia into the room. As Major General Kibanohara turns to follow them, I address him in a low voice. He knew what I was going to say. The kind of camouflage material capable of deceiving sensors like this has to be military grade. Which means someone else is secretly helping Sophia. I definitely sense a certain presence. And I'm sure Major General Kabanohara was aware of it as well. But then, why let them go? Is it Kiri? Huh. I silently follow after the Major General. This must be the freaking H scene, isn't it? Patreon.com to slash you guys. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so not used to saying that again after like all these uh, multiple episodes of Tokyo Necro. Patreon.com says Zakyosuke. Preparations are progressing steadily in the interrogation room. Repeating an apology after apology, Yamanuma sets up the torture device quickly and efficiently, of pleasure that still continues to assail her, causing her urine to arc in erratically. Unconcerned by the liquid being sprayed all over his body, Yamanuma mut mutters his apologies like a broken record. I think we're done? Jeez. That was uh, pretty creepy. I don't think you guys on YouTube would want to see that H scene to be completely honest. After having her sanity shattered by continuous torture, Sophia will no doubt give the Major General what he needs. It looks like I won't have to step in. I take a discerning look at my master while faint thoughts of Iria, and how much I long to go home to go home to her to her to go home to her, there we go, drift through my mind. So far, Major General Kibanohara's ironclad expression has hidden his emotions well. Right now, though, I can glimpse a faint of crack in his mask of steel. It's not like someone's con contacted him directly. Yet even still, he was able to pick up on changes in the outside world. After all, necromancers and the living dead they control are connected by an invisible thread. <laughs> I receive an order from Major General Kibanohara. It's conveyed clearly and in a straightforward manner. Further words un are unnecessary. He is my master, and as such, his orders are absolute. They cannot be disobeyed. Which means that right now, I must go and kill her. Iria? But why? Or is it Ethica? Must be Ethica, right? There's no way. Like, why the fuck would someone kill Iria? The sweetest of dreams are the most fleeting. Good times can only last so long. And as they say, time flies when you're having fun. Which is why preparations are so important. When happiness comes knocking, you gotta make sure to slow down and enjoy the time it takes to get to the front door. You know, I think I actually talked about this with Kiri once. Back when I first came here with Olga, I managed to follow that philosophy of mine to the letter. Right now though, things are a little different. She's just revealed that her real name is Roshak, and that she's a member of the... of the... What the? Of the, the laboratory? I don't think that's right. 
So whatever she has in store for me this time isn't something I'm too eagerly anticipating. <laughs> Roshak evades my question with a smile. I shoot her a glare. She's already tricked me once. After all, a person working for the laboratory wouldn't just come to me without some kind of an ulterior motive. I'm not one to ever let my guard down though, not even during sex. If she pulls a knife on me in bed, I'm confident I can take her down. Still, the fact remains that she lied to me. What is she hiding? Why all the deceit? What is she even trying to accomplish? And most of all, why show up now? Oh fuck this! I'm not getting anywhere. Fine. Whatever. There's no goddamn way I'm getting through this sober anyway. Like hell I can. I mean, when you're trying to get wasted, you don't really care about the taste. I take my glass and dump its contents into my mouth without even bothering to taste them. I mean, when I drink, I don't really taste the alcohol too. The only thing I can, like, actually taste alcohol is whether or not it goes down smoothly or not on my throat, really. どうして今更ここに来たのか。でも一番知りたいのは、私が信用に値するかどうかでしょ。She's giving me a completely different impression compared to when we had sex. Roshak shakes her head. Well, we saw what happened in the other route, don't worry. それをやり直すつもり。こぼれたミルクを投げても無駄よ。でも、こぼした人間にそのミルクがいかに貴重な人絞りかを思い知らせてやることはできる。復讐劇？あんたそういうタイプには見えないけど。Roshak brings her glass to her nose to enjoy the aroma of her whiskey before taking a sip. She takes her time to fully savor the amber liquid, amber colored liquid, like someone carefully determining the age of a tree using its rings. Probably 30 something? Medical science has advanced a great deal over the years. Using internally taken medicine to chemically slow the process of aging is hardly a pipe dream anymore. You can also restore the youthful quality of your skin with a simple surgery. In fact, many women working in the sex industry take this route, with the reasoning that it would be too much trouble to digitally alter their videos. Long story short, you can't tell a person's age purely based on how they look. If anything, it's their use of language or the way they carry themselves that can give away when they were born. The games or pranks that were all the rage when you were a kid. The routines they drilled into you during your school years. Stuff like that is burned to one's mind and is hard to get rid of. This is all part of the job. With no other choice left, I activate my X-Brain. It compares the statistical data available on a mesh network with the information floating in the depths of, the of my subconscious to predict the target's age. Huh? Even with how advanced it's been, how the fuck did she live that long? That's about... Wow, she... What? She basically lived before the Ice Age then. 
嘘はつかないわ184 years? That means Rashak was born in the year 2015. But the thing is, it wasn't until the 2120s that anti aging technology advanced to its current level. There's no way someone born in 2015 could still be alive today. At least, according to what my expert is telling me. So are you like a modern witch or something? ま、ない紛争の中で勝負として生きていくしかなかった。お決まりのコースよね。強い男から彼を殺したより強い男へ。美貌と起点を利用して戦場を渡り歩いて男の欲望を満たす道具としてだけ、かろうじて生き延びられ
not able to get sick, right? I <笑>死にたかったことは一度もないわ。死にたいと思いたいんでしょうね。生殖本能に抗って。そういう意味で私は数歳の罠水は。いろいろめんどくせえ。伊達に年は重ねてないわ。オーケー。わかった。I've <笑> I've made up my mind. Truth be told, I could tell she was hiding something from the moment she walked into my life. But I couldn't bring myself to hate her for it. I think I can trust that instinct. Rushak repeats the phrase like it's something entirely new to her. She looks out at the night nighttime cityscape. There's been a change of power, with a new order settling in. Yet Tokyo continues to function it is always as. As she gazes out the window in a daze, I decide to speak up. The ice in Roshak's gla glass makes an audible clink. There's no hesitation in her reply. I kinda like that. Well, you know what they say. Simple is best. The less complicated things are, the better. それで私に望むのは何確かに軍警察は気に食わないけどこの町の治安は火花原ほこやすを殺す手助けをしてあのさ。Her <sighs> borderline nonsensical request is making me seriously question her sanity。私あいつの娘なんだけどだから殺したいんでしょ殺してやりたいって。Sure, I've thrown that I've thrown that in his face more times than I care to count. But why did I never act upon it? Hell, I've had plenty of chances to murder him in his sleep. The drink in Drashak's glass sways a little. She's received a Condry message. After checking the hologram, she gives me a mischievous smile. Sorry, Ayuka. The humanoid operating machine created by Kurushima Michia. A pseudo human with an actual person's mind implanted in her. Probably the very first of her kind, too. What's more, the personality within her is that of Asa Yukari, Kiri's mom. Hook, line, and sinker. I think I'll do one more event before I call it an episode. I make my way across my across the city using one of the military military police's gray chameleons. Its interior isn't particularly different from the one we use at the agency. Owing to the temporary authorization granted to me by the military police, I can greatly exceed the permitted speed limit as I move over rows of cars and hurry toward my destination in manual driving mode. Before I can reach the Gijo Living Dead Stalker Agency, I spot Mitsumi, no doubt on her way home. Yeah. There's no way someone would agree to kill Iria. At that point, I think I think he's gonna be like, you know, not gonna be able to do it. He might as well kill himself before that happens. 
Mitsumi's expression tenses up as I utter the name. I open the door of the Grey Chameleon and continue onwards once she's climbed in. We pull onto the shootout expressway and make for the east. After allowing the auto driver to take over, I start checking my gear within the gently rocking vehicle. Mitsumi grips the hilt of Soshimaru looking restless. Okay, so they don't know that she's working with uh, Roshak yet. Most of the jobs we've been handling as of late have involved living dead stalkers that took the crime after losing their license. Tokitaka's case was no different. Love. Ethica and Major General Kibanohara. I had the impression that they were always at odds with, with each other. But to be perfectly honest, I don't know exactly what their relationship was like. I don't fully understand why Mitsumi is apologizing to me. And I no longer possess the capability to, dis to discern her feelings. I wonder, was that something I could do when I was still alive? Not really, Son. We arrive at the old Odaiba district. During the day, the elderly disposal zone draws quite the crowd, but the streets at night tend to be mostly deserted. The district is also fairly cold, in part due to the scarce number of hot pipes in the area. <laughs> I don't blame Mitsumi for suspecting a trap. Most people would either hide or set up an ambush. But if Ethicus called us out here, she's not going to do anything of the sort. She prefers things to be simple and straightforward, and won't hesitate to meet her opponents head on. The soft hiss of the seaside breeze murmurs in my ear. I spot the outline of a person near the shore. Bright red hair and the next brain on her head. Wearing a bulletproof coat, she wills her trusty custom AA-24. Mitsumi steps forward with confident movements. She shakes her head. A painful burden? Am I even still capable of feeling such things? I'm not sure. What is your reason? Mitsumi ready Soshimaru preparing to take on her fo foe fair and square. Her opponent too has her finger glued to the trigger of her automatic shotgun. Mitsumi darts forward with a resounding war cry. Her command of the battlefield is remarkable. In her mind, she's already several steps ahead of her opponent. The custom AA-24 never even gets a chance to fire a shot. Mitsumi's blade strikes the heart of her ill-fated foe. A spray of dark blood flies up into the air, followed by the deactivation of the high-density hologram that was projected over the assailant's features. The failed disguise reveals a face as pale as moonlight, belonging to a woman, a living dead, that looks nothing like Ethica. Mitsumi, however, does not falter. Her steady blade slices the woman clean in half. Ooh, sorry. If it was Ethica that called us out here, she'd meet us head on without resorting to underhanded tricks. She's not the type to set up elaborate traps like this. It wasn't Ethica who called us here. Mitsumi! Oenda! A group of men in military u police uniforms file out from within the abandoned containers lining the docks. They fix their assault rifles in the corpse lying collapsed in the ground. They're not. <laughs> of course they're not back up, you fools. A single gunshot rings out in the night. So we actually need to kill Mitsumi, huh? It came from me, 
and it hit Mitsumi. The impact of the shot sends Mitsumi to the ground, staining her bodysuit red with blood. Meanwhile, my aim remains fixed on her. I can easily kill her from this range. All I have to do now is await my experience instructions. That's all Mitsumi can muster up as she stares down the barrel of my real eliminator. Etika was never in the equation to begin with. I'm simply obeying the orders of my master, Major General Kibanohara. That's the only thing determining my actions. Why? Who who is so to you? Like what the fuck? I only shoot cr shoot criminals. Tokitaka said that right before I killed him. I have been ordered to take out Mitsumi. Major General Kibanohara is the law of the land, and if the law says she is a criminal, I must eliminate her. But my finger won't pull the trigger. It continues to tremble, refusing to obey my will. I... I don't understand any of this. Not myself, nor Mitsumi. My ex-brain always shows me the correct path to take, but right now, it's as silent as the night itself. I know what I must do to fulfill my master's command. And yet, my body will simply not budge. <laughs> my inaction provides Mitsumi with an opening, and it's not one she's willing to let slip by. She trips me and leaps to her feet, swinging Soshimaru. My real eliminators get knocked out of my hands and I, as, I, as I tumble to the ground. Mitsumi's blade slices my visor open, exposing my face. Our naked eyes meet. All she needs to do is deliver a quick thrust with Soshimaru in order to completely destroy my brain. And I have no doubts in my mind that that, that, that is exactly what she'll do. <laughs> Yet Mitsumi does not re-eliminate me. The military police officers surrounding the area finally react to what's going on. Their muzzle flashes illuminate the night. Mitsumi makes a split second decision, and it's the correct one. She leaves me on the ground without delivering a finishing blow, running to the shore. Without hesitation, she throws herself into the freezing waters below. The rifle barrage from the policeman continues as I hear the splash of waves. Their bullets, however, lose all momentum upon reaching the surface of the water. Mitsumi has kept her augment augmentations to a minimum, meaning she won't get pulled down by the extra weight and should be able to rise back up to the surface. But she doesn't. Before long, a new order arrives, prompting the military police squad to cease firing and return to their stations. I couldn't carry out Major General Kibanohara's orders. The mission was a failure. As the gunfire dies down, leaving only the seaside silence in its wake, I see the lingering traces of Mitsumi's freshly spilled blood melting into the, dar into the dark waves. Well, she's dead for sure. I allow the dusky red blood dripping from my hands to mix in with hers. Yet whatever meaning this act carries, I no longer understand it. And I don't think I ever will. God damn it, Son! Man, fuck you, Hokuyasu! Alright, with that though, I think I'm gonna call it an episode right here. I think tomorrow we're most likely gonna be finishing off this route. Because my friend said that this route was actually not that long. Well, compared to every route he played, he said that my route, my first route, was actually the longest, so... That's also reinforcing me, reinforcing my thoughts on the matter about how I thought that that was the true route. But yeah, it's not like the other routes we still don't, you know, hear about new stuff, learn about new stuff, so it's still very nice. We barely know anything about Hokuyasu and Olga and Mitsumi and Kazuma, to be completely honest. Most of what we learned on the last route was about Kansu and Iria. Right? And Milgram's, uh... 
you know, Milgram's Necropolis project. But yeah, with that, I'm going to end the episode right here. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Give this video a like if you guys like it. Sub if you guys haven't. Patreon will be getting these episodes early access along with everything uncensored. But to be completely honest, man, if you guys are here just for the eight scenes, I do not recommend pledging to the Patreon. The eight scenes in this games are super weird. <laughs> that last one with Sophia was so awkward, man. The one with, with Kansu was alright, but the one with, with Sophia was just creepy as fuck. And yeah, with that, I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.